Yeah, so today I wanna show you these funky laser cut wooden tiles. You can see they all have different patterns, different squiggles, they're cut out in different sizes. I'm hopefully gonna teach you a fun game that you can play with them. Before we get to the tile part, uh, you may or may not know this game we're gonna start with, Set. This is a card game. It's beloved by mathematicians everywhere in the world. It was actually invented in 1974 by Marsha Falco, who was a geneticist, so not a mathematician, um, and she invented it while studying epilepsy in German shepherds, which is very cool. I wanna take just a moment to explain the rules. So if we look at the deck here, these cards are not like normal playing cards. And if we wanted to describe them, we might notice that there are four characteristics that we need to describe. So each card has a color, each card has a number of objects on it, each card has an object with a certain shape, and each object has a shading. So what are the options? If I tell you there are three, then we can see what they are. So every card is either purple, green, or red. Numbers, again, there's three options. So we could have one object, we could have two objects, or we could have three objects. All the same, you'll notice, there's only one type of object per card. Then shape, we could have this oval, we could have squiggle, or we could have a diamond. And then the shading, we could have it be empty, we could have it have stripes, or our last option is it could be solid. And so in this table now, we have exactly one card for every combination. So for each card, you can only have one characteristic per quality, and so there are 81 cards total. Let's see your shuffling skills. What are your shuffling skills? <laughs> no, 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 no. You and I are playing a game. Well, first, you're gonna lose. I'm just kidding. <laughs> oh, no. Are you gonna, I'm gonna lose. We deal out 12 cards. I didn't do a great job shuffling, but we're gonna go with it. Okay, and so then we need our definition. So what we're looking for is a set, is a collection of three cards such that in each category, the cards are either all the same or all different. So what that's saying is that in each of the four categories, you either have one of each option or they all match. And it doesn't have to be the same for each category. You could have a purple card, a green card, a red card that all have one oval open, and that would be a set or you could have more variants. So let's see if you can find a set here. Okay, so, and, and you and I normally, we would be racing to see who- Racing, exactly, okay. exactly. But so we're not racing, you're- no, no, I'm gonna let you have all the time you need. So like, for example, these three here that have three ovals, mm -hmm. would they be a set? Or, or are, they, are they- So let's look at these yeah, three. Yeah. So they're not gonna be a set, they're good on the oval. So there's three ovals, yeah. they all have three, so. and they all have different shadings. But the color's a problem ah. because they're neither all the same nor so all different. Uh, so it's got to be multiple categories. Exactly. I'm with you. I'm with exactly. you. Exactly. All right. Okay. Well, that's not, it's not as easy as I thought then. No. Okay. Now I'll tell you, there is a set on the board. I, I okay. found one. Let me, well, how about, oh no, that's not a set because we've got two lots of three. Okay. Is that right? So that's no, not, that, that's not that, a set that, yeah, because there's two threes. Yep. Yeah, I see. Exactly. Why that, I see why that there's, a, there's at least two sets on the board. Okay. I've got a good feeling about this one. Mm -hmm. That, that, and that. <laughs> so I think that's a set because we've got a three, three, three. So we've yep. got a set on the number criteria. They're all the same. A red, red, red. All the same. All the same. We've got three different shapes. So there's three there's no shapes. Sh shapes the same. And oh, what's that? And solid, solid, solid. Perfect. That's a set. Okay. So in the game, I would then keep them and score. You would them. keep them, and we'd deal out three more cards. Right. And then you go again. Okay. I think different types of sets pop out to different types of people. So I often find much faster sets where all three colors are different. For some reason, it's just easier for me to find those versus the one you found is all three red cards. And so I think it really varies by what sets pop out to what people. Now, if you play this game, especially with mathematicians, it can get a little obnoxious how fast people are. I am actually not that fast of a set player. I'm just a big trash talker. And so part of the goal today is to show you some harder versions of this game that slow everybody down. So, Hang on, before we go, yeah. give us another set from that group just to show. Give us another, oh gosh, I'm so bad at this. Give okay. Um, my sister's gonna laugh at how long this takes me. Okay, so this is another set. So it's a similar flavor to the one you found. All the same color, all the same number, different shape, all the same shading. I would say that these two sets are kind of the same flavor set. So let's see if we can find one with different colors. Okay. Uh, so here's one where we have different colors. And you'll notice I found it much faster. We have three different colors, three different shapes, all one and three different shadings. 
So this one has more variance than, than these two sets do somehow. Nice. So, yeah. All right, I get it. Cool game. Yeah. Cool game. So part of why mathematicians love this game, beyond just being a really fun game to play, there is a lot of really cool math behind it and a lot of questions that we can ask. So we're not going to dive into that aspect. There's a lot of papers you could go read about it. But for example, we could say, must there always be a set if we deal out 12 cards? Right? Because theoretically, there could be a set or there could not be a set. Um, and that's a very famous question in mathematics. It turns out, until you deal out 21 cards, there doesn't necessarily need to be a set present. And you could also ask questions about how many sets are there, all types of things. Um, and so to explore any of these types of questions, we want to impose some structure on this game mathematically. And so the way we do it is that we're going to have a funky numbering system. The mathematical term, we might say it's a sort of modular arithmetic or finite field. The basic idea is that we assign a 0, a 1, and a 2 arbitrarily to our rows of characteristics. So arbitrarily, we say that purple 0, having 1 is a 0, oval 0, open is 0, and so on and so forth for 1 and 2. But we impose this funny rule that 1 plus 1 plus 1 is actually equal to 0 in this arithmetic. So for example, if I add 1 plus 1, then I get 2. But if I add 1 plus 2 plus 2, then I would normally get 5, but every time we see 3, we cancel it out. So this is actually equal to 2. It's modular arithmetic, exactly, mod 3. Um, and so with this, now for a card, well, we can assign to it a four tuple, a vector, where we put in the number corresponding to the character. So let's do this card here. So this card is red, so its color entry is a 2, because red is 2. And then there are two of them, so what number comes next? That's a 1. And then we have squiggle, so it's a 1 again. And its shading is stripe, so it's a 1 again. So we would call this card the two red squiggle stripes, the vector, or the 4 tuple, 2, 1, 1, 1. Yep. And so this, this will now give us a nice space that we can study. And we often say that this would live in like F three to the four. So this is just the three here is reminding us that we're working mod three, and the four is saying that we have four qualities. So we have now this dictionary, right? So we have our cards that we describe using these English words, and we now have a tuple. And so what's cool about this math system is that a set will correspond to three vectors, or quadruples, in f sub three to the four that sum to zero. And why is this the case? Well, if we think about what it means to be all different, right, then that means you have a 0, a 1, and a 2 showing up in that entry of your vector. And in our special math, 0 plus 1 plus 2 is 3, which we've said is 0. And if you're all the same, then you either look like 0 plus 0 plus 0, which is 0, 1 plus 1 plus 1 is equal to 0, or 2 plus 2 plus 2 is equal to 0. So if you're all the same in a category, then you also get a 0 in that entry when you add your, your vectors across. And so we get this really nice correspondence mathematically, where if you want to know what a set is, then you're really looking for three vectors in this space that sum to 0. Just to be clear, when I say 0, I mean it's 0, 0, 0, 0. So the vector length is four, it's four entries for our four characteristics. But a card gives, corresponds to one vector. So if we want three cards where all the characteristics are the same or different, then that means we have three vectors where each entry of the vector sums to 0. OK, so the one you found, so we have, so let's do our tuple. So what's this card? Well, we have red, and then we have three, and then we have oval, and we have solids. We again have red, again have three. Now we have diamond and then we have solid, and then we have red, three, squiggle, solid. So now when we sum these, the way that we sum across a vector is that we sum each entry. So two plus two plus two is six, but that's a multiple of three, so that gives us a zero. Again, two plus two plus two gives us zero. Zero plus two plus one, well, we had that case here. We get zero, and two plus two plus two is zero. I'm being a little sloppy with my equal sign here. I'm saying equal in this, in this space. If you had special goggles that let you see the cards as their vectors uh -huh. rather than as they appear, would that make the game easier or harder? That's a great question. And so actually, that I think this is part of why mathematicians love this game, is that you actually can think about it in terms of the cards. You can think about, I would say this is an algebraic interpretation. So we're thinking about it in terms of algebra. Or you could actually think about it in terms of geometry, where in fact, 
Um, if we lined up, for example, all of the red cards that are diamonds, then you could notice that sets are exactly the lines showing up in that space. And so we actually have another definition that's equivalent. So to answer your question, I think it probably depends on who's playing. Some people are probably really fast at the algebra. Some people might be really fast at the geometry. I do think at the end of the day that the cards are often the most fun way to play. And so I'll talk about this a little bit with these new variations of the game. But what you're really looking for is a game that is fun to play and interesting mathematically. All right, so now I want to talk about some generalizations of this game that I actually invented with two friends when I was in grad school. So the friends are Jonah Ostroff and Lucas Van Meter. Um, we just we love this game and we're very competitive, so we like to find new, harder versions of the game. How can we generalize this game to other mathematical structures? So if we think back to our to our original game, right, then we said we were over this f3 to the 4. That's kind of our structure. What do we need to make set, and I'll put it in quotes because I mean with other structures, the first thing we need is we need some collection of elements. We need some cards. So in this case, the elements are these four tuples with the numbers 0, 1, and 2, and our cards are our normal set cards. We need some way to combine our elements. In our normal set game, we took our two vectors, and we could add them component-wise. And so if you give me two cards, I have a mathematical way to combine them. So in whatever elements we come up with, we need a way to combine them. Then we need some sort of target, where something we're trying to get to. So again, in a normal game, what we're trying to get to is 0, 0, 0, 0. That's what we're trying to add our elements to. So if this is some type of target element, we could think of it as an identity or 0, depending on what type of elements you're working with. And then lastly, we want to know that for any two elements, there is a way to get to the target. right? Because if you picked two cards and there wasn't a third card that could complete the set, it wouldn't make the game very fun. So bare bones, this is kind of the minimal list of things we need. And in math, we might say one, one structure that satisfies is if we took a group. So a group has some sort of elements. It has an operation that allows you to combine your elements. It has an identity element. And you can always, if you pick a group element, you can always find a way back to the identity. So what I want to talk about for the rest of the time are different groups that we can play set on. And there are actually a lot of them. But today, we're going to talk about a specific type of group. It's called a permutation group. I'm now going to explain to you what these funky lines are. And so they're actually corresponding to permutation. So what do I mean by a permutation? Well, we're going to simplify things. And we're just going to say we're looking at some collection of numbers, integers, 1, 2, some number n. But we'll just say 3. So 1, 2, 3. And a permutation is a bijective map between these sets. So it means that every number on the left gets mapped to exactly one number on the right. And in particular, that means that every number on the right will be mapped to by exactly one number on the left. So for example, we could send 1 to 1, 2 to 2, 3 to 3. So that's kind of a boring permutation. A more interesting one might be we could send 1 to 2, 2 to 1, 3 to 3. So these are going to be our elements. So our elements are going to be these maps between sets of numbers. And so this group in particular, we might call s sub 3 because we're looking at three numbers here. And so now I said we need to build a combined permutation. So if this is our first permutation, how can we combine it with another one? Well, we just do what's most natural, and we concatenate them. And then for a second permutation, 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 3, and 3 goes up to 1. So then if we want to combine them, we just trace along the line completely. And so we'd say, well, 1 first goes to 2, and then 2 goes to 3. So 1 ends up going all the way down to 3. 2 goes up to 1, 1 goes down to 2, so 2 goes to itself. And then 3 goes to 3, and 3 goes up to 1. We now have elements. We have a way to combine them. I wrote down our target. And you'll just have to believe me for now <laughs> that for any two elements, we can always find a way back to our target. And it comes from the fact that these are going to be groups. OK, so now the punchline here is that we can play this game. And so on each of these cards, you have one of these permutations that show up. And so now the way we play set is that you're looking for some combination of three that when you put them together, you get back the identity permutation. Okay. But what's interesting about this version is that order matters. So if you think back to our original, there's no ordering on these cards. But there is an ordering for here. So once we deal them out, you have to find a subset in this order that compose the identity. So if we take these two, so one, okay, so it's gonna be this one. 
When we compose these three together, you can trace your finger along the one, it goes down and then back up, down, it comes back up, three, it goes up and then back down. So this is what we would call a set in this game. What are the red dots down the bottom there? That's a great question. So the red dots at the bottom correspond to whether or not we can write this as an even or odd number of swapping of lines. So there's a lot of theory behind these types of elements. And so it just helps, for example, you can prove that any set here has to have an even number of red dots. So it helps you when you're trying to find them because it's much harder in this game. I want the lines, the position of the start point of the lines. Mm -hmm. To start and end. To start and end in the same exactly. spot. Exactly, that's what you want. That's your identity. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Well, that so, sounds hard. It is hard. And to tell you the truth, this one is quite easy because there's only three lines. So let me show you the tiles now. We can do this for a lot of different sets of permutations. So on these tiles, you'll notice they have four positions, one to four instead of one to three. And it makes the game much harder. So with just three starting and ending spots, you have six cards. With four starting and ending spots, you have 24 cards. So these are laser cut, and you'll notice the wedge at the bottom. Isolate this one, right? You'll notice there's a notch here, and it's the same reason that you can write this permutation as exactly swapping two lines. So we have this one is harder to see, but you could write this one as well as an odd number of line swapping. So it has a wedge. And so the way we play is we deal out. That imposes an ordering on our tiles, and then we're looking for a subset. Now we play. This game's made up, so you can play however you like. But we play three or more tiles. It's very restrictive to say you have to have exactly three tiles. So for example, so these five tiles, which you'll notice I kept the order the same, we can trace our finger. One goes down to spot three, up to two, down to four, up to two, back up to one. Two goes up to one, across, down, down, up. And so you can trace across that you do, in fact, have the identity permutation across all five tiles. It feels to me like you've made the hardest game ever. Like, I feel like I would, look, I would look at a bunch of those tiles and it would take me a year in my head to, to make those paths. Yeah, so this is actually probably the hardest of the tiles I'm gonna show you. I've never found one myself when live playing. So this one I, can, I back constructed. And the interesting thing though is that the tiles are really fun to play with, even if you're not playing by the rules, so to speak just because you learn so much about how these permutations work. So I would agree, I think this is the hardest of the tiles that we have. Uh, so for my, so if, if you've got a bunch of them in front of you, even you can't see the, the paths. Yeah. There are other people who are better than I am. So I have seen students or other colleagues um, find sets in this. But uh, uh, let me show you the other tiles because I think they're actually, they get more complicated mathematically but actually easier to play. So the next one we have here, I have them on paper first. We have two games at the same time of our original S3 set. So the red and the blue games don't know anything about each other. You're just playing red and blue at the same time, which makes it a lot harder. And so to win, you have to have a simultaneous set on top and bottom. Cool. Crazy. Now I have seen people find these sets live, but you can see the tiles. And again, if you look really closely, you'll notice that there are wedges at the top and the bottom to, again, that really helps when you're looking for these. You can join them together. So you'll notice like this one, this bottom has the little circle here. And this one has a little diamond up top. And that corresponds to the fact that they're transpositions. And then just to see how they combine these ones, if you combine these two, you get this. And so for this one, I actually just have a set pre-done, so we won't even be looking for it. We can just see, because I think these are really hard. Although I will say, some people find these really fast. So if you look here, on the top, we trace along, we get our top line works, our second line works, and then we automatically get our third line for free if we have the right number of wedges. Um, and then similarly for the bottom, hopefully this is a set. Yep. Yep, okay. We might call this S3 cross S3 set, which is saying that we have two copies of our S3 set and they're independent of each other. So there's no relationship between the two. So now we actually come to my favorite version of this is called wreath product set. And it was actually suggested by Josh Mundinger at a summer program that I work at. These cards look very similar to our ones before. So recall these were our S3 cards. So you notice they have the same sort of S3 permutation, but now they have these blue dots as well. The rule is that 
if you have two marbles on a strand, they cancel out. So every time you have two marbles, they cancel out. So if we wanted to combine these cards, I claim it's equal to this card over here. So let's see why. Well, on our first strand, we come across. It starts and ends in the one position, so it goes straight across, and the two marbles cancel out, so there's no marble left. The second line, it goes across, up, back down to the third position, so we have two going to three, and there's one marble. And then the third line goes up to two and across, so the third line goes from three to two, and it has three marbles, so we cancel. We cancel out. So to find a set in these cards, we want the identity permutation in S3 plus an even number of marbles on each strand. And so these tiles, I think, are very pleasing, the way that they're laser cut out. So again, you see the marbles are these holes on the right side. The wedges are still there. So I have a, a deal for us. Now, I say this is partly my favorite because this one is actually playable, I think in terms of just staring at it for a little while. So to save us time, I think two, three, um, five, and seven make a set. So if we combine those together, then we have one, it goes down to the bottom, across, back up, two marbles, two goes back to its starting place, two marbles, three goes up, down to its starting place, and two marbles. So that would be a set here. What's really interesting about this, going back again to your question about playability, is that this game of S4, right, is actually equivalent to a subset of these wreath product tiles. So it lives inside this game, but somehow this game with, with our dots is way more easy to keep track of in your eye. Like, it's way easier to play compared to this. I find this impossible. These are, I find, quite fun. And so I think another fun aspect of these is just when you're trying to learn about these types of groups mathematically, you learn all sorts of properties just from playing with the tiles. If you look on the website, there are some versions back to this original game of set, some twists on that, as well as some other visualizations of games that already exist. Sure. Yeah, video description. We'll have a link. Um, and I also should say for me, um, as a math educator, I think one of the biggest utilities of these games, besides being fun, um, is they have been really helpful for me in the classroom, I think, where just when you're starting to get familiar with um, these types of more abstract ideas in math, it's really helpful. For example, with these wreath product sets, it's a really nice visualization of what's called a semi-direct product. And so I think the exercise of writing out the math to go along with the tiles, you learn so much.